Well, welcome back to this little mini series we're doing on what the whole Bible has to say about God's revelation of Himself. And this evening we're going to um, begin our second session under this heading, The Inherent Religiousness of Man. So in our last session, we highlighted two important truths that the Bible teaches. First, that knowing God is what we were created for. It's the doorway to eternal life. Okay, so theology or the knowledge of God is important. Uh, but secondly, we also saw that left to ourselves, it is completely impossible for us. If it was left up to us, we cannot find God, uh, let alone know Him. Now, the combination of those two truths, that we, we must know God, but we can't know Him, that combination leaves us with a major problem. So, if we want to know God, where do we start? What can be done about this horrible situation that we're in? Well, before we tackle that question head on, there is a discussion which we need to have concerning the universally religious nature of man. Man is, and this is in your workbook, man is inherently religious. In other words, the answer to the dilemma that is facing us, you know, how do we know God, is an answer that is universally sought after. I'm going to read to you a quote by uh, J. Rodman Williams. Um, it's a slightly lengthy quote, but it's a good one. Um, if you apply your mind and just concentrate while we're reading it. He says this, Throughout the history of the human race, people have again and again raised the question about the knowledge of God. The importance of this matter is evidenced by the universal search of mankind in which the knowledge of God has been the ultimate concern. Human reflection invariably turns beyond the question of knowledge of the world and man to the question, how do we know God? Multiple religions, all representing mankind's highest loyalty and commitment, are essentially attempts to find the answer. And many a philosophy, which is meant to be a religious philosophy, many a philosophy has turned toward the knowledge of what is ultimate as the paramount and final pursuit. So, we repeat, human reflection invariably turns upon the matter of knowledge of God as the ultimate concern. This concern may be hidden for a time amid the many affairs of the world and man's self-centered preoccupations, but the question will not go away. Something in man, it seems, cries out for this supreme knowledge, and unless he is willing to acknowledge and pursue it, Life never achieves its fullest satisfaction. We hear the words of Philip, Lord, show us the Father and we shall be satisfied. The cry of the heart is for finding God, beholding Him, coming even into His presence. And then uh, 500 years before that, the great John Calvin in the Institutes of the Christian Religion, his great work, he put it this way, all those who do not direct the whole of the thoughts and actions of their lives to this end, the knowledge of God, fail to fulfill the law of their being. The law of their being. Isn't that a beautifully put statement? So man is inherently religious. We cannot escape the desire to find and know God. And yet, because of sin, that desire is bent. It's bent away from the one true God. And it results in all kinds of false religions, uh, false idolatry, strange philosophies. But the desire is still there. And this is why. Teaching children pure evolution, where there is no God, is so damaging to their sense of the world. Because it is telling them to suppress, in fact it's telling them to entirely forget about, that natural desire to know God that they are born with. Did you know that in the history of anthropology, so anthropology is the study of man and of civilizations, in the history of anthropology they have never discovered an atheistic tribe. Every people group has always had some kind of God or gods that they sought. So our question is this, what explains this inescapable religious urge in people? Well, there have been several explanations of this since the days of the Enlightenment, but the most prominent ones are probably the Marxist explanation and then the secular humanistic explanation which comes in various forms. We'll look at that now. Let's begin by looking at the Marxist explanation. 
So Karl Marx, who lived from 1818 to 1883, was a German philosopher. He wrote The Communist Manifesto and a three-volume work called Das Kapital, among other things. And in those works, he laid out a social theory which was aggressively anti-capitalistic and and anti-social classes. So he talked about the bourgeoisie who were the ruling class who exploited the proletariat who were the kind of lower class workers. And he wanted to see a, a communist classless society established. And his writings to this day have been in, uh, incredibly influential in politics and economics all over the world. Now Marx said this, he said that religion exists in order to enable the ruling class, the, the bourgeoisie, to maintain its power over the lower classes, the proletariat. And he is famous for saying that religion is the opiate of the masses. So it's like a drug that the ruling class give to the masses to keep them submissive and orderly so that they're easy to rule. In other words, Marx believed that religion is just a tool that's used by the powerful to keep the weak subdued. And that for the lower classes to be truly happy, he said, they had to give up the illusion of happiness that religion gives them and abolish religion altogether. But I'm afraid that that doesn't answer the question at all. Because the very fact that religion does have such power over the masses is a testimony to how universally powerful this religious urge in man is. You know, just because it's been abused by the powerful doesn't explain where it comes from. I can use a Vienna sausage to manipulate my Great Dane. His name is Jack and there is very little that Jack will not do for food. But just because I can use food to manipulate Jack to sit and to give me his paw, it, it doesn't explain at all why that dog is always so hungry. So we're back to the original question. Where does this religious urge come from? And then just to say, as the evolutionists of our own day, well, it evolved. It evolved as a mechanism to protect human life. Well, that simply is not an answer. You don't just get to shout evolution and throw billions and billions of years at the problem without any proof. Saying that, that the religious urge in man is a result of millions of years of evolution is a completely unfounded theory. And if you accept that, you accept it by faith. Okay, so what have others said? Well, there are these secular humanistic explanations, and probably the father of, of that was a guy called Ludwig Feuerbach. Feuerbach lived from 1804 to 1872. He also was a German philosopher. These German philosophers have caused a lot of trouble. Uh, and, and he was an anthropologist. He was probably best known for his book, which was called The Essence of Christianity. And that book provided a critique of Christianity, which strongly influenced generations of later thinkers, including Karl Marx and uh, Friedrich Engels, who was Karl Marx's protege. Now Feuerbach said that religion must be explained as a psychological wish projection of an ideal father figure. So religion is a cry for help. It's a cry for help in our fears and our insecurities in life because our human fathers cannot perfectly allay all of these fears and insecurities we have. We feel unsafe in life and we, we really want there to be some big strong someone who is always with us and will lead us and protect us. But it was C.S. Lewis who was that great Oxford academic who turned from atheism to Christianity. He wrote books like The Chronicles of Narnia and Mere Christianity. It was C.S. Lewis who said in response to Feuerbach that the, the fact that people want there to be a God is no argument that there is not a God. You know, you can't point at the world around you and say, look, everybody wants there to be a God. And so obviously there is no God. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. In fact, to the contrary, it is an indication that there is something implanted in the hearts of people. And where did that come from? Well, the Bible tells us. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says this, God has put eternity in their hearts. God has put eternity in our hearts. Well, it was Sigmund Freud who then came along. And in his book, Totem and Taboo, Freud was, as you know, a psychiatrist. And in his book, Totem and Taboo, he said this. In his practice as a psychiatrist, he had observed that most psychological disorders were in fact caused by guilt. 
And guilt, said Freud, is caused more often than not by God, because people somehow have a sense of God's impending judgment of their sins. And so, said Freud, what we must do is we have to get rid of God, and that is now going to solve all the psychological problems of our world. Just get rid of God. But again, that doesn't prove anything. Just because people feel guilty, it doesn't mean that they're not. You know, Freud's solution to people's feelings of guilt is not the right solution. If you're standing on a railway track and you see a train coming towards you, the answer is not to deny the existence of the train. The answer is to deal with the problem, get off the tracks. You know, seeking God's forgiveness for our sin is surely the answer to feelings of guilt instead of denying Him. But this is the irrationality into which sin has plunged us. Okay, so you see what is happening here with all of these men's explanation of things is that they, as with many people today, were working with what we call a presupposition. And that presupposition is that there is no God. Now a presupposition is an assumption that you make before you even enter into an argument. And you simply assume this thing to be true and you build your whole argument based on that assumption. For example, you and I might look at a chair. And we might get into a debate about whether or not we think that chair is going to hold my weight. But in order for us to have that discussion, both of us have a presupposition. We are assuming the normal functioning of the laws of gravity. Okay? But what if someone were to interrupt us in our argument and tell us that the chair is actually on the moon? You know, we would then suddenly see that our whole conversation was wrong because of an incorrect a presupposition. And that is exactly what these philosophers are doing. They simply assume that there is no God and they argue from there. But that is an unproven faith assumption when in fact there is ample evidence of the existence of God, a point to which we will turn in later videos. Okay, so if those are some of the secular humanistic explanations for man's religiousness, what then is, in your workbook, the Bible's explanation? How does the Bible explain the religiousness of man? And the simple answer to that question is this. Man is religious because God has made him that way. And as we continue our discussion in this video, you're going to see how plainly the Bible makes that claim. So let's get back to the main question that we're asking tonight, and that essentially revolves around how we can even begin knowing God, which we all desire to do because of that universally religious urge. In other words, what is, and this is in your workbook, the next major heading, the starting point of theology? So if the Bible is telling us the truth when it says that to know the one true God is to have eternal life, and that Everyone has a natural religious urge to have that knowledge of God, but that left to ourselves, we cannot find Him or know Him because God is infinite and holy and we are finite and sinful. Okay, if those three things are true, then what are we to do? How can we come to know about God and how can we come to know Him in truth? Um, in the words of your manual, the question is asked this way. Can the obstacles of our finitude and sin be overcome so that we can know God? Now that is a huge question. A few years ago, a man wrote an article on News 24's website angrily declaring his atheism. And in the opening section of that article, after saying how he used to be a Christian, which I seriously doubt, he said the following. I would now describe myself as an atheist in the sense that there may be a creator, but if there is one, it's totally meaningless since this God engages in no way in our world or cares what happens to us in any way. Is that right? Because many people believe this. Most people are not pure atheists, which is to say that most people don't firmly believe that there is no God. But most people are what we call deists. Now, a deist is someone who believes that there is a creator out there somewhere, but once he created the universe, he stepped away and he's no longer involved. 
you know, I, I mean, who knows? You know, the universe was created so many billions of years ago, or so the deist thinks. Um, you know, the God who made it is probably dead by now, and if he's not, he's completely removed from this creation. He's uninvolved, and who knows? You know, how many other worlds could he have created in the last few billion years? And so, of this, you can be sure. Uh, thinks the deist that God is not watching you now. He's not with you. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And I think it is fair to say that that is how most people live in the world we live in today. They may not frame the argument so clearly, but that's how they live. They live as if we cannot know anything for sure. And actually, discussions about God are irrelevant. So why bother? You know, let's just stop thinking about God altogether and get on with our lives. Now, to be fair to the deist, it must be said that unless God had taken the initiative and revealed himself to us, unless God had done that, the deist view would actually be the wise and justifiable worldview. Because as we've seen, the Bible itself does say that left to ourselves, we, we can't know God. Okay, so again, we ask this question, can the obstacles of our finitude and our sin be overcome? Can we come to know God? Well, if they are to be overcome, J. Rodman Williams tells us how it's going to happen. Let's read the quote. If there is to be knowledge of God, He Himself must grant it. It must come from His side, out of His mystery, across the chasm of finitude and sin. In other words, there has to be revelation. Now, what is the meaning of that word revelation in your workbook? The meaning of revelation, it comes from the Latin word revelare, and then the, the word which the New Testament uses, because the New Testament was written in, in Greek, it was apocalypsis. And what it means literally is to pull back the veil. So where once you could see and know nothing, now someone has pulled back the veil and, and all is revealed. And what J. Rodman Williams is saying in that quote is that only God can reveal God. We don't pull the veil back. He pulls it back. So what this means is that we can know God only on the grounds where He gives Himself to be known. Hilary of Poitiers, who lived in 350 AD, so this is the latest stuff, he put it brilliantly. God is His own best witness concerning Himself. God is His own best witness concerning Himself. Now that is contrary to the rebellious heart of man. We don't want to submit to the ways of God and His revelation of Himself. Throughout the ages, people have tried to force God into their own box. And that box is always shaped after their own desires. So one of the most common expressions of this that you've probably heard people say is uh, statements like this. I don't believe that God would send people to hell. Or, I don't believe God cares about our sex lives. Or, how about this one? I don't believe God loves me. Or, I believe that all religions are basically the same. They teach the same thing and that whichever God you serve, as long as you're a pretty good person, you know, He's not going to condemn you. Now, those are all examples of people's creating a God after their own image. You know, those are statements of people who will not submit to the revelation of God of Himself. They do not believe that God is his own best witness concerning himself. And so they imagine a God who will allow them to do what they want to do and think what they want to think. Now, nowhere was this better illustrated than in the European Enlightenment. This was a period in history coming out of the 16th and 17th century Reformation, which had emphasized the truth of the Bible. But then in the 18th century, people proclaimed this to now be the new age of reason. And their view of the knowledge of God was that God should fit into the parameters of our own rationality, our own reason. And if any so-called truth, even if it was in the Bible, does not conform to our sense of reason, you know, if it's not rational to us or explainable by us, then we are free to reject it. So that's what the Enlightenment philosophers said. And they rejected the inspiration of the Bible and they demanded that God make himself known to them in their own way, not in his way. But as Hilary of Poitiers tells us, we don't get to make up our own God. He is his own best witness concerning himself. And we must submit to him as he reveals himself to be. 
We must come to God humbly to know Him where He has made Himself known. He lays down the terms. So, question. Has God laid out such terms? Has God pulled back the veil and revealed Himself to us? And if He has, where do we find this revelation so that we can truly know Him? Well, we are, now in our next video, we are finally going to tackle that question head on. And I'm going to do it by turning to the scriptures to see how the Bible itself makes this claim. So, together in our next session, we are going to turn to the book of Romans and we're going to work through Romans chapter 1 together, which is amazing. And I look forward to seeing you then.